The aim of this session is not to have some kind of discussion on history, but to go back 500 years to see the amazing fulfillment of Bible prophecy, but also crucially, what the faithful, and I mean the faithful, those who were dedicated to finding the truth laid out in the scriptures and living by those principles, what they thought was happening at the time and how it gave them strength to endure terrible trials, the kinds of trials that we've read about at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, to endure to the end, and also oftentimes knowing that the Lord wasn't just about to return in their day, but they still carried on. Amazing faith that was shown. Now, we're not going to assume, uh, we're not going to give, give the full proofs of each Bible prophecy that we go through. We, ha we have to assume uh, a certain level of familiarity with prophecy. So if people are wanting that, there's many places you, you can get that, many books you can read. But we're going to assume a level of understanding of biblical prophecy so we can move with a little bit of pace. You'll also see that a lot of the slides have quite a lot of words on them. Uh, don't worry, I'm not expecting you to read them all. Amazingly, some people have a penchant for looking at these things on YouTube with, with mobile phones, but you can't read anything anyway. So I'm going to paraphrase, but just in case people want to look back and see the words that we're quoting in their context and the exact references so you can check it out for yourself, uh, they'll be there on the screens for you. So just want to start with uh, a book that was written in uh, 1949. Uh, Chris Delphian published a book because it was the 100th anniversary of the lecture tour of, of John Thomas over here in the UK. It lasted into 1849. And when John Thomas was traveling around, there was huge interest in Bible prophecy. And it says here, John Carter writes, uh, to set forth the light that Bible prophecy shed on events then current. So back in 1849, John Thomas was talking a lot about prophecy. So John Carter wanted to bring this to mind. And so he, in the book, Faith in the Last Days, he brought a lot of John Thomas's writing together and he wrote a foreword. Now look what he says in his foreword. He talks about um, how that in Europe, the understanding of prophecy was growing because the learning that had been there in the East uh, came across after the Turks took Constantinople and all of that learning came across. Now he's listed here, John Carter has, some of those who wrote on prophecy, they're very well-known names like Joseph Mead, Jurier, Sir Isaac Newton, Bishop Newton, and so on. And uh, the Brotherhood was very well aware in about the 1950s of these writers. Now, what's remarkable is that um, there, there are many more that we can add to them, and they were added later by the work of Alan Eyre, Brother Alan Eyre. But what we just want to remind ourselves about is, what, as you can see on your screen, you've got Daniel 11, uh, Revelation 11 and Revelation 12. Talk to us of the biblical teaching that there would always be those throughout time who were keeping to the truth of the scriptures. Now, how do we know that? Because it tells us in Daniel chapter 7 that this fourth beast, the Roman beast, was, verse 21, going to make war with the saints. It was, verse 25, going to wear the saints out. For how long? Well, for time, times and dividing of time, for 12, 60 years, uh, which we'll look at uh, briefly in a moment. Revelation 11 says that those witnesses would continue for that time period. And Revelation 12 says those ones who'd be uh, made war against were those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what we know is that throughout the ages, God has preserved a remnant. Some of the remnant we do know about, and even more in our time than we did just a recent decades ago. Some have been lost, forgotten in the period of the Dark Ages, where the established church did their job well in expunging them and their record and all that they wrote from history. But Brother Alan Eyre, in his work, shows that that list of prophetic writers based on the scriptures, and they, their studies were based on the scriptures, is very incomplete. Brother Alan Eyre in his books here up on the screen shows that brethren were unaware of all of these other groups. And it wasn't until after the Second World War when the libraries of Europe started to open, they started to be catalogued correctly and openly, that you could find all the evidence of believers in the past and, and how they strove for the truth and how they had a strong focus on prophecy 
to, to boost their faith. Now, we're going to lean heavily on the work of Brother Alan Eyre. And if anyone wants any lockdown reading, I highly recommend these two books. Uh, not just actually the books themselves, but the references. It's the, the reference list in Brethren in Christ is, is put together better than the one in Protesters. But what we live in in the world today is a place where the work that Alan Eyre would have perhaps taken weeks to do, it takes us a matter of hours. We can go online to any number of projects which are digitizing books. And where Brother Alan Eyre said this book was rare, it took me a long time through a correspondence with librarians to try and search out just one copy. Now there are no rare books because that one rare book is now digitized and online searchable. So you can search for anything you like, even in the old English, and it's there. Absolutely amazing resource that we have, brothers and sisters. Truly knowledge has increased. Now what Brother Alan Eyre does, he takes us back 500 years takes us back to what he calls the year of decision when there were brethren trying to strive for biblical truth and they were told if you carry on your teaching about adult baptism that you believe that only adults who have the choice uh, the understanding to choose whether to be baptized into the saving name of Jesus or not if you keep to that practice and don't uh, agree with infant baptism you'll be put to death now what did these brethren do at that time Alan Eyre records a contemporary account. They linked themselves into a brotherhood of faith. They call themselves Bruder in Christa, the Brethren in Christ. It was scaled by, by, sealed by a solemn uh, but intimate breaking of bread. And then what did they do? They went out to preach. They didn't have to. They could have held their beliefs quietly in their own homes and told no one about it. But they decided to go out and tell people. They chose to witness. And what was the result of their witness? Most of them were in the prime of their life. Ka Jacob, who was also known as George Blaurock, Manns, Aberli, Hutzer, Brotley, were all burned, drowned or beheaded within five years of this Zurich meeting in places hundreds of miles apart because they decided they were going to go on a campaign and they were going to split themselves up and go out and spread the word of the truth. And they were put to death. They chose that because they knew it was right. And they wanted to declare the authority of the scriptures, not just on baptism, but they wanted to tell everybody that the scriptures are the only authority that we believe in. That the Lord Jesus Christ will come and reign again on the earth. That Jesus was the son of God. And they rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. They looked forward to the resurrection. They taught fellowship based on doctrine as the basis of breaking bread together. And they understood the concept of fellowship in the ecclesia. And they went out as they were known, the brethren in Christ or the Swiss brethren, to carry out this amazing witness. And there were so many of them. Ferenc David, here's uh, his memorial at the place of his death uh, in what is now Romania. He went out as part of uh, those who believed these things to teach. He was put in prison. And he died eight years after he was put in prison. But let's just focus for a moment on prophecy, because they didn't just focus on doctrinal purity based on the scriptures. They also understood prophecy, uh, prophecy and, and things like the Antichrist. Now, wherever you read in the ancient prophetic writers, you'll find almost ubiquitous everywhere the discussion of what the Antichrist is. It is he who puts himself in the place of Christ, not against Christ, but the Greek word anti is in the place of. And they understood that very clearly to be the established Roman church. And they knew that that Roman church was against them. And so they were persecuted by that church. Now, Alan Eyre says that brethren in Christ inevitably, because of their experiences, led them to identify Rome as the biblical antichrist. Their understanding of Bible prophecy and the, particularly the apocalypse wasn't new to them. There were many others before them that knew these things. And crucially, look at this. In the 16th century, the 1500s, the need to place their own trials and labours in the context of the divine plan led the brethren to meditate deeply and prayerfully over the details. They wanted to know where they were in God's plan. Do we do that? You and I meditate deeply and carefully, knowing where we are in God's wonderful prophetic plan. That's exactly what they did. And the interpretation of the apocalypse 
followed by, for example, John Thomas in Eureka, the, the historicist approach or the continuous historic approach. That's what they understood, that God had set out and gone throughout history and tell us, well, you start here and you go throughout. And that, that's what Brother Tim has been talking to us about. The Lord Jesus Christ opened those seals in the book of Revelation so that the process could begin for the work of Christ to carry out the prophecies laid down in the Holy Scriptures. And you can read on the screen there how the brethren studying the apocalypse knew where they were. And crucially, they knew that they themselves were the witnesses spoken about in Revelation chapter 11. Witnesses would be persecuted and slain for the faithful testimony of the truth. Can you imagine that? You imagine that you're there 500 years ago and you're sitting in a room and you know the truth of the scriptures and you say to your brethren, what shall we do? Keep it to ourselves or go out and die for the truth. And we're going to die for the truth because we know that's going to happen because the Bible tells us that's going to happen. We are fulfilling the witness and likely we will die. What shall we do? And they chose to witness, knowing that not just they thought they could die. The truth of the scriptures said that the witnesses will be put to death. And, of course, John Thomas understood that. He understood that their witness had been cruelly extinguished. And he understood that they understood also Revelation 11 was their witness and their persecution. Now, that is absolutely remarkable. Would you and I have done such a thing? We could only think deeply about our own witness and what readjustment we might need to make. They knew what would happen, and they did it. And they understood that the Lord Jesus Christ had opened up the seals and he's going throughout history, the seals, the trumpets and Revelation 11 there, the end of those trumpets. They knew that was them, the witnesses that would be persecuted for that time period of 1260 years. And they knew that that was them and they wanted to be a part of it. Now, let's focus on another group closely linked with the Bruder in Christo, the Brethren in Christ, was the Polish Brethren. Now, here's a writer. Uh, Adrian Sobolewski, who writes on Polish culture, he's written it in, in 2017, and he talks about the golden age of liberty in Poland. There was a time, about 500 years ago, where there were brethren who held the truth of the scripture, and they did have, um, remarkably, a period of liberty. There's one of their um, meeting places up on our screen. They're also er erroneously many times called Unitarians. They weren't Unitarians. Today, Unitarian often means somebody who believes that Jesus was a good man, but not the son of God. Whereas we know the scriptures teach that Jesus is the son of God. He's not God himself. The Trinity is incorrect, but he is the son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, born of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's what these brethren believed. Right? And so, as you can see on the screen, uh, quoting from uh, Adrian, he's talking about they denounced the, the, the Holy Trinity. They were critical of the papacy and of the clergy and of their excesses. Uh, they were conscientious objectors. That's what we call them in our term. They wouldn't take part uh, in, in anything to do with violence and the state. They separated themselves from that. They knew that biblical principle. And for that period, about 200 to 250 years, there were 150 ecclesias throughout the Polish lands. They had an academy called the Rakovian Academy, and they wrote so much about the truth. They had a thousand students at one point. The Lord Jesus Christ, with the, the angelic host ministry, had allowed a wonderful period of, of uh, safety for the truth for a little while. While others were being put to death in other places, the Polish brethren had a wonderful blessing. Now, notice that they went further than Poland. They were there, especially in the Netherlands. Note that. And what they decided to do was, they said, well, look, we've written so much about the truth of the scriptures against the dogma, which is false, coming out from the established church not just the Catholic Church, but the Lutheran Church also, and the offshoots of that, they decided to write uh, um, the Bibliotheca Fratrum Polorum. They, they decided to get all of our works together and say, right, in 10 volumes, this is what we think. And they did that in 1668. Now, what was the response of the Catholic Church? They said, right, we're going to have to put your book in our index, Librorum Prohibitorum, the list of books that are prohibited. And they tried to expunge from history the Polish brethren, just as they had done to many others throughout the Dark Ages. But this time it hasn't worked because the, the words of the Polish brethren, what they fought for, what they believed in doctrinal sense and prophetic sense can be there for us to find today. Some of the Catholic theologians 
we're told, went as far as calling it one of the most dangerous publications to Christianity. The Polish brethren were dangerous. Why? Because they went to scripture alone for their authority. Now, this is just an example, you know, of, of the amazing, prodigious and, and prolific writing, really, of, of the, the Polish brethren. They, they wrote booklets like this, Exposure of the Harlot of Babylon and of the Antichrist, of the old and new mystery and abomination and the reign of the true Christians. Now, you imagine writing a booklet like that now. We say to ourselves, don't we, well, it's, you know, we, 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 we aren't be so harsh. I don't even like using the word harlot, so let's not put that in there. Uh, exposure of the Antichrist uh, as the Roman Church, well, you know, let's let's tone it down. That's the sense, right, uh, that we can often have in our day, and that's unacceptable. Look what they did. Look what they proclaimed. They knew that if they went in certain areas of Europe, they would be put to death for these writings. Yet they did it. Remarkable. Now, Sobolowski says something really interesting. He says a really astounding number of intellectuals, especially from Great Britain, read and engaged with this movement. Among the most recognisable, it's impossible not to mention John Milton. Right? He himself, John Milton, was accused of being a member of, of the Polish Brethren by Oliver Cromwell. Now, John Milton was a civil servant in the United Kingdom, a famous poet, and he was accused of being a member of the Polish Brethren because in his library, he had their writings. So did John Locke and so did Isaac Newton, who wrote so much about religion and they were religious leaders in their time. The Polish Brethren who held the truth of the scriptures, their writings had gone far and wide. Remarkable. Thus, it can be said, says Sobolewski, that the Brethren's theories were one of the foundation stones for the upcoming enlightenment. Look at that. You can imagine how the Lord Jesus Christ commanded his angels that this word would spread out and the truth would be given. Now, here is John Milton, known for his, his poem on Paradise Lost, which is about the fall and Adam and so on. Right? But here's, here's a copy of his book. I don't know whether you can see it. It was recovered after he died because he didn't want people, I don't think, uh, to, to see what he really believed about the Trinity until after his death. It's called The Last Thoughts on the Trinity. Do you know what the other title of it is? A treatise on Christian doctrine compiled from the Holy Scripture alone. Now, John Milton, with his library full of books from the Polish Brethren, said, if you look at Holy Scripture alone, the Trinity is incorrect and unscriptural. And he was put on trial for that during his life. But he managed to live out his life until an old man. Other men we know were not so well blessed. Before him, men like William Tyndale had also identified the Roman church was Babylon, the man of sin or the Antichrist, someone who put himself in the temple of God, in the place of Christ. He knew all of that. And he also knew about the resurrection, the kingdom of God being set up on the earth. And it's Brother Alan Eyre who suggests that perhaps he was put to death, not because of his translation <clears throat> of the biblical texts, because there were other translations extant at the time, but because of what he believed. He knew the truth of scriptures. And there's some evidence to know, to suggest that William Tyndale did come into contact with some of the brethren in Christ through his travels through Europe. This is the writing of Froome, who writes a lot about this period, and it's readily available online and searchable for you. But while this was all going on, the Christian community came into contact with the Jewish community. And they found in each other's writings a shared understanding of the return of Christ. Just look at this. Here is Manasseh ben Yisrael, who's the chief rabbi of Amsterdam in the 1620s. Now, we just read, didn't we, how that a big group of the Polish brethren went to the Netherlands, where Amsterdam is, just in case you're wondering, if you're from America, you might not know that. Sorry, that's a, I had to just have a cheap dig there. But the point was that that's in the Netherlands, where they were putting all of this work together, the Polish brethren, the Jewish community were also writing. Here is the chief rabbi of Amsterdam who believed that Jesus' appearance was nigh at hand, but not Jesus. In his words, he calls him the Messiah because he wasn't looking for the second coming, but the first coming of the Messiah. He read about the glorious stone of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And he understood from that image that at the end, Christ would return and he'd gone through all the images of the empires. Now, his book, 
we're told, was received by many Protestant theologians, and they were also you know, convinced, but not of the first coming of the Messiah, but the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Manasseh ben Yisrael, he wrote about things on Nebuchadnezzar's image, which Bible students of prophecy will know very well, shows us the broad sweep of history and of the empires of the world, bringing us right through to Christ's kingdom. He wrote about that to whom? To Oliver Cromwell. Here is, on the screen, his mission to Oliver Cromwell. He wrote to Oliver Cromwell to ask if it would be possible to readmit the expelled Jews to England. John Milton was a civil servant under Oliver Cromwell and having his library full of the Polish Brethren's books. And look what Ben Yisrael says. There's his uh, starting, uh, which I hope he won't read all of that. He says, I also show in this book that as they, the Jews, were not driven out at once from their country, so also they were scattered in diverse provinces and shall at last return to their land and shall be governed by one prince who is the Messiah, the son of David. And without doubt, that time is near. Where, reader, thou shalt find diverse histories worthy of memory and many prophecies of the old prophets opened. Right. So he's talking about. The, the, the Jews being scattered, we know that, he says, and they will come back and they will be under the one prince who's the Messiah, who is the son of David. He understood the promises to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But because the veil of the law was on his eyes, even as it is on uh, the Jews today, they couldn't see Christ. But he could see the Messiah for sure. And he also was one of the ones who started to get people to use again the term the hope of Israel which he says was taken from Jeremiah 14. It's one of the titles of God. It's an Israelitish hope. And so he writes to Oliver Cromwell and says, I appeal to you. Given that this hope of the scriptures is called the hope of Israel and God has such a purpose with his people, the Jews, and that they will return to their land and that the Messiah will rule over them, the son of David, let us enter back into Britain. What an amazing appeal. You can see what was happening at the time. The scriptures were out there being explained. Now, I want to change gear just slightly now, and, and just look at a little bit more detail of what uh, these uh, Bible students, many of whom did understand the biblical truth, really thought about some of the detailed prophecies. So <clears throat> here's David Catreus, right? And he's writing in 1571. And he's writing about that time period we mentioned earlier in Daniel chapter 17 of the 1260 years. Now, students of prophecy have known for a very, very long time that Daniel 7 is talking about a time when the Roman church, because it's linked with that fourth beast with iron teeth, is going to have a preeminence, a dominance over the, the saints who will be worn out and warred against for 1260 years. And what Catreus says is, well, let's try and work out when that started. We think that's from when emperor focuses... Um, decree went out to declare that the Roman church was the first of all churches. And if you add 1260 onto that, he got to 1866. So what's he talking about? I know that this is a, a horrendously unappealing slide to look at. I apologize for that. But the point is, is that Daniel 7 is the one which says the saints are going to be worn out for 1260 years by this power that comes out uh, of the, Daniel's fourth beast. Revelation 11 says that the holy city is going to be trodden down 42 months. And if we work that out with the lunar calendar, times by 30 days in a lunar month, also gets us a 1260. The witnesses, says Revelation 11, will prophesy 1260 days. Daniel 13, mirroring the language of Daniel 7, says the same thing, that this, this beast has a mouth speaking great things, and he's going to have power to continue 42 months for 1260 years. What's he going to do? He's going to mirror the language of Daniel 7, He's going to war with the saints. So men like Atreus looked carefully and they said, well, we know we're right in the middle of this time period where the, the Catholic Roman church is in ascendancy and they're wearing out the saints. But it's going to come to an end around 80s, 1866. Remember, this is 300 times earlier. Catreus is writing. Here's Joseph Bellamy, who's writing in the 1750s and he's waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he say? He says, well, when shall these things be accomplished, i.e. the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
not until the end of the 42 month period, not until the witnesses have prophesied 1260 days or 1260 years, a year for a day principle, not until the woman who holds the truth that the ecclesia has been in the wilderness for time, times and half a time. People knew Daniel 7, Revelation 11, Revelation 13. And here's Joseph Bellamy, who was faithful in his ministry, who knew Christ was not going to return until at least after this time period, when the ascendancy of the Roman beast church would be lowered. Absolutely remarkable. How about us? How do we feel when we know that there is nothing left to happen? Or nothing that has to happen, let's put it properly, before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. How are we taking stock? They could say things like that. They could say we expect this or that to happen before the millennial reign of Christ. We can't say that because the prophecies have been fulfilled before our time. Now, John Gill's commentary is really well known. It's available fully online. People talk about it all the time. He's writing also in the 1740s, and he has exactly the same calculation as Catreus, that if you take the year 606, then you add on the 1260 years, you're looking for a time around 1866. He says, we cannot be certain. Remember, he's writing in the 1750s, but that's what we'd be expecting to bring an end to Antichrist's reign. That's what he's saying in his writings. Now, just to remind ourselves what actually happened, you can go to the Catholic Encyclopedia up here. Now, Pope Boniface, he did get that decree from Emperor Phocas, who, who uh, died in 610 AD. And he said, from now on, the bishop uh, in Rome is going to be the see of blessed Peter the Apostle, shall be the head of all the churches. Let's put Constantinople down a peg or two. It's the bishop in Rome who leads. He's called the universal bishop. Now, when that happened, he went up in the ascendancy. And Bible students have said, well, that's the start of this 1260 year period. You add it to the end of Focus's life, you get to 1870. And Bible students were watching, watching carefully what would happen. And what did they see? They saw during the 1800s, Napoleon chip away and away at uh, the papal states, the temporal states that were run by the Pope. He owned them. Now, Napoleon invaded um, earlier and again in 1850. They were, they were reduced. And by the time you get to 1870, the papal states were finally annexed to Italy in amazing fulfillment of the 1260-year time period. From the time when they ascended under focus to 1260 years to the end in 1870 that was fulfilled now they that those are the signs of their times our brethren in times gone by and they were amazed to see it are we amazed by what we see in our time now let's go into a little bit more detail if we can about what they thought about the vile period in revelation 16 now we've seen in uh, our first talk how there's those seals trumpets vials now, the Bible students in years gone by looked at the Revelation and they saw the vile period and they identified that this has got to be poured out on Europe, the place where the beast reigns. And they identified this drying up. So they said, not only have we got this time period of the end of the 1260 years we're looking for, there's more detail given in Revelation 16 about the judgments upon the seat of the beast. And they identified it with all of these things. Thomas Goodwin, right? He's writing in, in, in the mid 1600s. Look what he says. He has seven vials containing the last page for plagues. To do what? To dispatch the Pope and the Turk. The first five of which dissolve and gradually ruin the Pope's power in the West. And that's what happened. Gradually, the power of the West, uh, the Roman church in the West waned. The sixth vial breaks the power of the Turk in the East. The drying up of the Euphrates and it prepares the way for the Jews, whom he means to bring into the fellowship of his kingdom in their own land. You see what was how specific they were in the 1600s, where people were dying for their faith. Here's a man who says, yeah, I know what's going to happen. Long after my time, 
the R- Roman rule in the West is going to be dissolved and gradually reduced in power. And the Pope's power will eventually come to an end at the end of that 12, 60 year time period. In the East, the Turk is also going to dry up. What For what purpose, they say? So that the Jews might return to their land, as God has promised. Now, Samuel Hopkins, amazing writer, says the same things. He's writing in 1793. He's looking for a time way after his time when the river Euphrates would dry up. He's looking for the utter ruin of of the Pope and the hierarchy of the Church of Rome and their temporal power. He was able to write these things because he knew what the Bible had said. He also wrote of the Jews. He he knew that they'd been nearly 2,000 years in a state of great affliction. They'd been cast out, just as God had said. But he says God will not make a full end of them. They'll be brought back, he says. They'll repent and return to the Lord Jesus Christ against whom they and their fathers have sinned and unto their own land and fill all that vast tract of land given to Abraham and his posterity uh, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Look at their level of understanding. Based on those that have gone before who read the scriptures, they knew what was going to happen in the vile period right the way through to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They knew the Jews had to return and that they will again accept the Lord Jesus Christ incredible what was going on while people were dying for their faith prophecy was known and understood by those who would listen and so when we look at revelation 16 again this is the historicist understanding of it brethren knew that at the time and faithful bible students before that understood the period by which all these things would take place and they were the signs of their time is that not remarkable And more well-known people like Joseph Mead, who was known to uh, John Thomas and to John Carter, they wrote about these things. But there were so many others beside who could see the truth of all prophecy being fulfilled. There's our friend Catreus again, who in 1571 understood what was happening in the vile period. Now, it's remarkable. And some people have said, over the years revelation can't be understood can we stop talking about it and it really isn't nice to point the finger at at any others you know for example the catholic church and say that they're wrong all right now if we start to think like that we're taking in the spirit of our age we're acting from expediency that which is convenient rather than that which is based on the truth of the scriptures If you yourself are struggling to say, well, I'm struggling to see prophecy fulfilled and understand it, then put the time in, put the effort in. But look at all the people in the many centuries gone by, at least 500 and and many centuries before we can show, they did understand Bible prophecy. And it was going to happen hundreds of years after their time, but they wrote about it because they saw what God had said in the scriptures. They just carefully read the word of God and understood it from there and from not other sources. It's amazing. And we need to be excited about these things and encouraged. So just to take stock at this point, what did they, the brethren in Christ, the Swiss brethren, the Polish brethren, and others beside understand? Well, they knew that they were the witnesses of true biblical faith. They knew that they were fulfilling Daniel 7 and Revelation 11. They knew that there would come a time of great trial, French Revolution, that would affect Rome. They knew that concurrent with the witness time period, the Roman Catholic power would be in the ascendancy, but it would end. And that did happen in 1870. And they knew hundreds of years before that that would happen then. And you imagine their faith to say to themselves, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop my witness, even though I know There's a time period of 300 years left in front of me until these things happen. And Christ is going to come after that. They didn't stop. They said, that's just increased my faith. I know that God's in control. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ is being done. And I'm going to carry on my witness. And if necessary, I'll die for it. Remarkable. And some who lived a little later saw the early beginnings of those who thought about the Jewish return. Those that knew that was going to happen would have been excited by that in those days. Just look at this writing. Now, it's dense text, but I want to quote for you from one of the most remarkable writers, I think, David Austin, who's writing 
from Elizabeth Town. Now, I don't know which Elizabeth Town it is because there's about 50 of them in America. They weren't very imaginative with their place names. Um, in any case, this may be the one in Pennsylvania, but look what he wrote about. He's looking for the Heavenly Father. Maybe he's writing in the 1780s. He's looking for the Jews to start to return to their own land, he says. God will send out fishers and hunters to bring them back. And then he says, look at this. We may fairly conclude, I think, that some nation lying far west of Judea, possessing shipping, will be the instrument of bringing about the restoration of the Jews, and that it is likely to be one of the European powers. Now, students of Bible prophecy will know that all the work that has been done identifying Tarshish, that shipping power, that merchant power. Brother John Thomas wrote about this extensively and many others besides. Now, here's Adam Austin, who's looked at the scriptures and he says, I think one of the European powers is going to be instrumental in restoring the Jews. They're merchants. They're involved in shipping. Furthermore, look what he says. From Ezekiel 39, we can understand that the conversion of Israel is to be dated from the destruction of the army of Gog and whose invasion is certainly to be some considerable time after Israel's return, and when they're in the possession of Jerusalem. This is remarkable. Here's a man who says, yeah, the Jews are going to return. They're going to definitely have possession of Jerusalem, which is prophesied as well, isn't it, in Daniel chapter 8. There's that time period that takes up 1967. He understood that, and he said, a long time after that, there's, there's going to be the destruction of Gog, and then after that, they'll be converted. And then he talks about who is this go? He says, well, Rosh, that's associated with the Scythians and with the Russians. It's, it's like listening to a Christadelphian Prophecy Day talk up to date, isn't it? And he talks about the Jews then being converted. Incredible that this was the understanding of people in time gone by who understood from those who came before them. The witness has been there and people who really wanted to search out the truth of doctrine and prophecy. They could see it. So exciting to consider these things. There were so many others besides. Here's just an example of Joshua Spaulding and his lecturing um, in the US. Um, and then there's Thomas Hartley on the right who's talking about Paradise Restored. That's a play on Milton's work, Paradise Lost. No, 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 he says, Paradise Restored. Look at the blessed millennium that will come. Here's Elias Smith Look, in, in the, the 1760s and the 1800s. Look what he's talking about. He's giving a lecture, just like Christadelphians too, on Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He's talking about the future revival of the kingdom. And look at his title, which is found for one of his lectures. The whole world governed by a Jew. Would you give a, like, a lecture title like that? In this sensitized world of the day, people might say, well, it might be offensive, you know. You, you shouldn't do it. Uh, who knows what people could think? Well, the whole world will be governed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And when our brothers and sisters died for what they believed in, how dare we, brothers and sisters, say, you know, we mustn't upset anybody. We don't want to upset anybody. We want to tell them the truth of the Bible. And if a title might encourage people to come in and learn something new, then let us use it. That's the truth of the matter. The whole world will be governed by a man of the stock of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See, these, this is remarkable. Now, look, look at the summary of Alan Air and the protesters. It is true to say that the French Revolution was no surprise to those in the 18th century believers who lived to witness it, nor was the decline of the Turkish power, nor was the small early signs of interest in the Jewish return to Zion, nor was the fate that befell the papacy under the successive blows of, Revol of Revolution and Napoleon, that's the vile period in Revelation 16. For these believers two centuries ago, these were the signs of the times, and they knew what they heralded. They knew it. And they acted with such faith. What an example to us. And then onto the scene comes John Thomas and his work, Eureka, on uh, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, and on Elpis Israel. Now, John Thomas wrote, I am persuaded with greater specificity than the writers who'd gone before. Just look at the words here. He talks about a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the return of Christ. And the pre-adventual colonization of Palestine will be on purely political uh, principles. It's just amazing the way that they wrote and understood because they based their, what they believe fully on the scriptures. And so when the brethren looked for the sixth vial to be poured out on the Euphrates, that's what they saw. 
and other writers that we've got up here who added to the many others and said, we know that's the Euphrates power that's going to dry up. They saw it. John Thomas wrote about it in Eureka in 1861. That was yet future to him, but he knew it would happen. And we know that it did. Here's the Ottoman Empire as it's flooding its banks. But the brethren knew that though it did not look likely at all, it would dry up to prepare the way for the Jews to return to their land. And that decline of the Ottoman Empire happened and is well known amongst us. It's one of the amazing fulfillments of Bible prophecy in the last 100 years. But more than that, brothers and sisters, what do we have? We have all the discussions that we often speak of, of things like the, the symbol of the, the 12 stars and how they go back in ancient times to Rome and how that they fulfill the principles laid out in the Holy Scriptures. How that these symbols known in the ancient scriptures are there in the world of today. Brethren knew that there would come about a European Union. John Thomas spoke about a European Commonwealth forming together because he knew the details of Revelation 17. Robert Roberts in 1884 talked about Europe coming together in a unanimous policy. It's ridiculous to suggest it at the time. Europe was torn about by war for centuries before and after. So much war, but they said, no, no, Europe's going to come together. Unanimous policy. Samuel Garrett understood that there would be something called the United States of Europe that would be a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Truly amazing. And that is what we see in the world around us. The fulfillment of Revelation 17, where the ten horns, the nations in the former area of the European Union, voluntarily choose to give their power and their strength to one unit, never before happened in world history, unique in world history. So we know where we are in the prophetic time period. This is happening now in our time, that the European nations voluntarily give their power to the central unit. And it's known as that. Manuel Barroso says the European Union is unique in the history of mankind. It's the organization of empire. He says, we, what we have is the first non-imperial empire. There's never been anything like it. We have 27 countries. It was 28. Now it's back to 27. That fully decided to work together and to pool their sovereignty. It is recognized in the world that that has never, ever happened before. And yet Revelation 17, that that is going, says that that is going to happen before Christ returns because they're going to make war with Christ. It's remarkable. Bible students were looking for it and we see it in our time. And further than that, our brethren knew, didn't they, that in that formation of the European beast, Britain would be separate. Our brethren, and here's Paul Billington writing in 1990, John Thomas in 1850, that Britain's not going to be part of this European system that's forming. You know, these brethren were mocked for even saying that Europe would form together. But they said it. I remember them being mocked as a young man in South Wales. I heard it. And I know some of you did, too. Brethren laughing at those who said there's going to be a European Union, who said that Britain would come out of Europe. And that's really what it comes down to, brothers and sisters. In our time, the worst we get is people laughing at us. They laughed at the Apostle Paul at Miles Hill when he declared the true God. They laughed at Josiah when he said, come down. Come down and worship in Jerusalem. They laughed at his letter. And if that's all we get, we can endure that. Graham Pierce wrote about how Britain will separate from Europe at a time 40 years ago when it looked ridiculously unlikely. And there are those who, who've been involved in these things and worked in government and saw how in the UK, the, the, the UK was at the centre of European government. But our brethren said, when we're looking at the scriptures, we're looking at Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 17, we know Britain's got to separate of this European Union that would form. Absolutely amazing. And so what we have is more, brothers and sisters. We have more than our brothers and sisters of 500 years ago in every single respect. We have more religious freedom so that we might witness without hindrance. Now, not all of our brethren in this world at our time have that. We know that. But if you have the technological capability to dial into a talk like this, the chances are you do have religious freedom 
in incredible speed loads, greater than the Polish brethren had for their little time period. We have greater religious freedom. We have greater resources. Brother Alan Eyre talks about our brethren who were in dire poverty. They had to move very often to save the lives of their families because they knew they would be persecuted unto death. They, they couldn't store up goods. In fact, some of them said, brethren, we, we mustn't rely on storing up goods. We've got to rely on a heavenly father. We put down roots, brothers and sisters. We store up goods. We have resources that they couldn't have dreamt of. And more than that, we have more prophetic proof. They only went down to the third bullet that we have on prophecy fulfilled. They knew they were the witnesses. They knew they would die for what they believed in, many of them. They knew about the vile period and the destruction of the Catholic Church at the end of that witness period. But that was it. We've seen the drying up of the Euphrates power. We've seen the reestablishment of the nation of Israel that so many looked for for all those centuries. We've seen it. We've had over 70 years of it. We've seen the European Union being formed. We've seen the fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel 8 of Jerusalem being Jewish again. It's there in Zechariah 12 to 14 again. It has to be Jewish because of the prophecies that require it of the latter day. This very year, we've seen Britain exiting from the European Union. The flag of Britain has been taken down in Brussels and it will not rise again. We're in the transition period and who knows what we'll see next, but we've seen it. Our brethren have years got by, could, couldn't have dreamt of seeing it, but they did. Well, they did dream of it uh, in the sweetest dreams I'm sure they had. But we've seen it. We're looking back at it. And we're looking at Israel, which hopefully uh, I know our, our brother um, Daniel will talk about in his next talk about how Israel's fulfilling prophecy after prophecy. So, brothers and sisters, we have more. We have more freedoms. We have more resources. We have more prophetic proof upon which we can base our faith and not faint. And what are we going to do with all of these incredible proofs? Let's go back. Just to conclude, 500 years. See, Alan Eyre makes an appeal to us. And he did this in the 70s. He talks about the Christadelphians are making in this modern age a serious endeavor to uphold the New Testament form of Christianity. Are we doing that? More and more people, he says, act only from expediency and fewer and fewer from principle and rooted conviction. Our brethren decided to witness and die for it. What are we doing with our greater freedoms and resources, technologies and prophetic proof? He talks about the fact that the witnesses in time gone by, our brothers and sisters, they were the salt of the earth to try and save the world from its corruption. And he asked the question, are we going to compromise and sacrifice ourselves to the Moloch of expediency? Are we going to say... It's just too difficult. Let us just bear our faith in the corner. Go to our ecclesial halls and not preach too much. Don't, don't ruffle any feathers. Don't upset anybody. We don't want to upset anybody, but we want to tell them about the truth of the scriptures. And he, Alan Eyre talks about the two great challenges which face the body of Christ today. Materialism, he says, and the unfinished work of witness which lies upon us. Materialism, he was writing in the 70s. How much more materialistic are we now than then? How much greater are the resources that we can accumulate? Unfinished work of witness? How much more witness can we give now with such prophetic proofs before us? What are we doing with our time? Here is George Blaurock, the one who was called Kai Jacob, one of the founders of the Swiss Brethren. He was there back in that room in 1525 when they broke bread together, when they decided that they had to witness and they had to go out and they would likely die for it because even the scripture says that those who witness in this time period, which they knew they were in, would die. And he was called to give an account by Zwingli, one of the leaders of the church at the time. He, Zwingli had come out of the Roman church, but then persecuted just as the Roman church did. And they quoted the church fathers. And George Blaurock says, what have we to do with your doctors, the church fathers and the councils? They were men as we are and subject to blindness as we are. We don't want to have evidence from outside the scriptures 
We're not interested in that. That's the challenge of our time. Yes, materialism. But those trying to bring things that are never mentioned once in the scriptures as authorities by which we should live our lives and shoo all them into scriptures cannot be done. Then the old argument was raised to George Blaurock. How can you be right, George? There are so few of you and so many of us who believe in the Trinity and who believe in infant sprinkling. How can you be right? The brethren's answer was always that statistical counts were irrelevant. That by their very nature, the witnesses were few in number. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a remnant. They were few in number that stood against the vast authorities of the time in all their power and might. And that little witness was made. Statistical counts don't matter. And then George Blaurock is reported to have said, baptism, we all agree, is a ceremony of the New Testament. Therefore, we demand a plain passage with which you support infant baptism out of the New Testament. The word, the word, the word. Why will you, like the night owl, hate the light and refuse to come into the sun? The word, the word, the word was their cry. And with that threefold refrain, George Blaurock was burned to the stick. Like so many of his faithful brethren at the time. And brothers and sisters, if we're looking for an antidote to the materialism and the apathy into which we can fall in our time, read the end of Hebrews 11 again that we read to start with. How that they were tempted, sawn asunder, slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute. They were for hundreds of years since this time to our time. George Blaurock was like that. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. You know, brothers and sisters, I think to myself sometimes, I don't know how I'm going to be able to stand in their presence in the kingdom age. Sometimes we can say to ourselves, well, those in ancient time, they had the power of God and the, the visible witness of the Holy Spirit was there in our time. Well, faithful they were. But the Holy Spirit was not in operation 500 years ago. How would the conversation go in the kingdom age, brothers and sisters, if we meet Swiss, the Swiss brethren and the brethren in Christ and they ask us, what persecutions did you face? And we answer, none. A few people giggle at us now and again. They laughed at us. When they ask us, what resources did you have? We had everything more than you can imagine with the technology of our age. Did you have to go from place to place when you were persecuted to give your witness? No, we, we, we put down roots and we stayed in peace and safety with big ecclesial halls and no one made us afraid. When they ask us, did you witness? What are we going to say? Did we witness? These men and women went out to witness to their death. And I say women because it is recorded also that many other sisters died as well. You want to read an account of that? You read the account of Michael Sattler, a young man who was put to death horribly for his scriptural beliefs. And his young wife was given a week to change her mind, to say, don't die as he did. Come back to the faith of the Trinity and of infant sprinkling. And she would not for her marvellous faith. And she too was put to death. That was in 1527. You want an antidote to apathy? And you read the accounts of these brethren. You read them in your lockdown. And you remember the list of Hebrews chapter 11. The word, the word, the word. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ left us a message. Let us the ecclesias were all told. Remember, I'm coming back. Some of you will know that I'm not going to come back before a certain time period. And they did. But don't, don't forget, I'm going to come back. Repent. Hold fast till I come. I'll come unto you as a thief. Behold, I come quickly, he says. I stand at the door and knock. There was only one ecclesia in all the seven. Who was, it was not necessary that they should receive such an exhortation. Which ecclesia was that? Smyrna. Smyrna is the only one of the seven who did not need to be reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ would come quickly. Why? Because they were being faithful unto death. 
they were already standing up for their biblical principles. If they'd have wanted to run away and hide and not declare the truth and not live by it, they could have done it, but they were living by the truth and so would be faithful unto death. They are the only ones who didn't need the reminder. The state of all the other six ecclesias, which state we find ourselves in, brothers and sisters, young people, need to be reminded to repent, do the first works, because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He's going to stand at the door and knock. Brothers and sisters, we are right at the end. We have to be. Look at all the things that have come to pass. Surely the door is there and the Lord is about to knock upon it and open. We're, we're at Joel chapter 3, verse 9. We're at Revelation 6, verse 14, where the Lord will soon come as a thief. We're at Ezekiel 38, verse 9. All of these things have come right throughout history and we can see the evidence. We can see what they believed in their time and how it gave them strength. And we look back on it with amazement. And so we ask ourselves, what will we do with the time that is left to us? We have to make a choice. We've got to be encouraged. We've got to put aside the materialism of the world. We've got to put aside its apathy. We've got to be encouraged. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ is being done. And crucially, it can be done in us. We can be the last witnesses that we might join the list in Hebrews 11, that they without us should not be made perfect. What will be our answer when we look back at the prophetic work being done by the Lord Jesus Christ and so many others throughout the ages who joined themselves unto that work in faithfulness, both doctrinally and prophetically? What will be our answer in our time? There can be none other than to witness with all our might while there is time yet to do it.